When I think of the cross, I think of the insults and the mockery that came from the crowd. I think of a painful 39 lashes and the excruciating pain from a thorn-filled crown. When I think of the cross, I, I think of brutal suffering and the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus willingly stepped into. You see, the greatest act of love is for the innocent to stand in place for the guilty. And that's exactly
exactly what Jesus did when he stood in place for you and me. It's what we call grace. And in a moment of grace, far beyond anything that we could ever comprehend, Jesus took on all our anger, all our anxiety, all our brokenness, all our pain, all our past, every single mistake, all our shame. He took on all the things that we try to carry, but they're just so heavy. But Jesus didn't come just to simply take those things. He came to give us freedom. Because of him, you're no longer lost to your past. Because of him, you're no longer a slave to your shame. Because of him, you're no longer a prisoner to your pain. Because of him, you're no longer bound to your sin. Because of Jesus, we can actually take these things and lay them down at the foot of the cross. See, God's love has liberated us, you and me. Free to forever walk in the light of His amazing grace. Well, good morning, church. Happy Easter. Why don't you stand so we can worship together?
An exciting day that was, the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And I'll tell you, it changed the course of human history. You have to factor Jesus into the story of our world. You can't just get rid of him. You know, I was interested, I was reading this morning in our little devotional time, maybe some of you are kind of going through that devotion together, and it tells the story of Jesus And it says, one day Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. Little did they know what was about to happen. As they were traveling across the lake, Jesus fell asleep, and then a storm came along, and it was so terrifying that they thought they were going to drown. And they woke Jesus up. He got up, and he rebuked the wind and the raging waters, and the storm subsided, and all was calm. Where is your faith, he said to his disciples, in fear and amazement. Isn't that interesting? Now, they were afraid initially because they thought they were going to die. Now they're in fear because they're thinking, who is this person? They ask the question, who is this? He commands even the winds and the waves, and they obey him. How many realize that Luke is basically telling us that Jesus is more than just a man here? He's actually behaving in his... Uh, in his godhood. In a sense, he's, he's telling the elements of the world how to respond. And isn't that amazing that we are serving someone who has that kind of power? It's, I, I'm excited about that. We want to welcome you this morning at Living Stones. We thank you for joining live stream. And we're going to have uh, an opportunity to pray for people that are, have needs this morning. So I'm going to have the altar workers come along. And if you have a prayer request, a need in your life, we believe that Jesus is here present and alive today. And we're going to talk about that a little later. That Jesus did not just uh, die on a cross and that was the end of the story. You know, the true story and the ultimate story is that he rose again from the dead and therefore you and I can live with a confidence that we have eternal life. And uh, God's power is here today. And so let's believe God together for miracles. I want to invite you to come and pray.
we are so thankful for the cross. We are so thankful for your sacrifice so that we could come to you. We are so thankful that the veil was torn so we can be in your presence. God, we thank you for the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of us. And God, we pray today that your presence would just be falling so heavy in this place and that we would know that you are with us. Amen, church. Amen. Well, why don't you turn and greet those around you and welcome them to church on this beautiful Easter Sunday morning. Hello and welcome to Livingstone's Church. And whether you're with us in person or joining us online, we're just so glad that you're here to spend part of your Easter weekend with us. We wanna invite you at this time to fill out a Connect card and you could send your prayer requests or simply tell us if you need any information about LSC. For those of you that are joining us online, you can fill that same form out at livingstones.ab.ca connect. And if you wanna to give today, you can also do so at the information center right after the service. And if you'd like more information on all of our giving options, including e-transfers, click the give button on our website. Get ready for the most exciting event of the summer, Living Water VBS 2024. Now VBS or Vacation Bible School is a kids day camp at our church that hosts 200 kids for five fun-filled days. VBS is from August the 12th through 16th from 9 a.m. to noon every day. This year, we are diving in to explore the beauty of God's underwater creation, and we will learn about water that's so refreshing that Jesus said we would never thirst again. Pre-registration for our church family opens today with a special QR code. And if you like more information, you can look for our VBS booth in the foyer. After reflecting on Jesus' death on Good Friday and celebrating his resurrection today, we'll be gathering for three nights of prayer and fasting happening on April the 8th, 9th, and the 10th. Spring is a time of hope and renewal. And so let's come together as a church family for a special time of worship and prayer. If you'd like more information, you can check out our website. Ladies, mark your calendars for our spring event coming up on April the 22nd with our guest speaker, Linda Davies. Join us in the Fellowship Hall at 7 p.m. for the beauty of simplicity. Invite a friend and learn how to find freedom in the simplicity of life in your home and your workspace. Registration is only $15 per person and you can do so online by April the 15th. Don't forget to check out the cafe after each of our morning services, where you will find a delicious Easter buffet and lots of fellowship. This week's feature items are lemon sage turkey, maple Dijon glazed ham, and empty grave chocolate pudding dessert. Our full menu is posted on the bulletin board in the hallway on your way down to the fellowship hall. Hey, thank you so much for spending part of your weekend at Livingstone's Church, and we're so thrilled to have you here. If you have any questions about anything you've heard today, or maybe you'd just like to learn more about LSC, just stop by the Information Center, or you can visit us online at livingstones.ab.ca. If you're new here, we want you to feel right at home, and so we want to invite you to stop by the guest reception kiosk after the service, and we have a gift for you, and we'd love to meet you. I will now dismiss middle school youth and pass it on to Pastor Paul. Happy Easter and have a great day at church. Amen. Why don't we stand this morning as we go to the Lord in prayer? Amen. So Father, we do thank you this morning for all that you have done for us. Thank you for the country we live in. We thank you for the measure of grace that we're experiencing. We thank you for your many, many blessings in our lives, Lord. We have so much to be grateful for. Father, I pray today that you'd open the eyes of our understanding, open our hearts, help us to hear your word, Father. Help us not to just hear words, but Lord, may they speak into our innermost being. May they be life-giving words. We read in scripture that it says, we, sh we don't live by bread alone. We can't just live by that which sustains us physically, but we live by every word that proceeds from your mouth, Lord. We live by that which is nourishing our spirit, our inner being. It brings meaning, purpose, significance in our lives. And Father, I pray today 
that you would grip us, that we would hear your voice today uh, personally and collectively, Father, that you would speak a word uh, in season to us right now, Lord. And as we leave this place, may we be able to say that you spoke into our souls, strengthened us, encouraged us, challenged us, convicted us. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. 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 You may be seated. On February 27th, 1991, Ruth Dillow was at her home in Kansas when the phone rang. It was the Pentagon, and she was informed that her son, first class Clayton Carpenter, had stepped on a landmine in the Persian Gulf War, and unfortunately had passed away. It was an awful, sickening reality to learn that her son would never return home again. Three days later, Ruth received another phone call. The voice on the other end said, Mom, I'm alive. Ruth said at first she could not believe it was the voice of her 23-year-old son who she had been mourning deeply for the past three days. She said, I jumped up and down, screaming, overjoyed. You just have no idea how excited I was. Well, you can imagine, how many say that would be a very uh, unusual experience? It would literally rock your world, and to go from that depths of despair to the heights of elation all within a few days. And yet, that's the story we're going to look at today from the scriptures. The earlier followers of Jesus had witnessed his betrayal, the hastily assembled verdict that was a sham to justice, and they watched as Jesus was crucified. During the next two days, they grieved, struggling with shame for not standing with him in his last hour. And their dreams, their personal dreams and hopes were, had been crushed. Like Ruth Dillo, the moment came when they heard the incredible, seemingly unbelievable news. Women from their company came breathlessly into the upper room declaring that Jesus was alive. You can imagine how shocking that report was. And then to continue on, Jesus appearing to them on more than one occasion. Actually, the scripture said, as many as 40 days, Jesus kept coming, appearing, teaching, training. So Jesus is alive. That's the message of Easter. It's a message of hope in a world of despair. It's a message that our society desperately needs to hear today. It's a message that the first disciples were preaching. It's the message that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost to the people in Jerusalem 50 days after the death of Jesus, in the very place where Jesus had been crucified. It was during the Feast of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit, true to the promise that Jesus had communicated to them, had now filled them and empowered them so that they could become dynamic witnesses in their generation. And after explaining the miracle of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, they heard them speaking in tongues, the languages that they themselves knew from many parts of the Mediterranean basis. Peter began to explain that this was what was prophesied by Joel in the Old Testament, that in the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. But then Peter doesn't stop there. He continues on after an explanation to give an exhortation, a message, a challenge to them regarding what had just transpired in the last 50 days. G. Campbell Morgan says, at the heart of the mission of Jesus is the resurrection. It is the most significant event, not only in the life of the church, but I believe it's the most significant event in human history. It's literally defined, you know, before Christ and after Christ. Our whole understanding of history is moving from creation to the culmination where Jesus returns back to this world in which he and the Father and the Spirit created. Today we're going to celebrate the reason for his, for death's defeat. Sin no longer has authority and dominion in our lives. Why? Because Jesus himself conquered the greatest enemy of humanity, and that's death itself. 
And Easter Sunday is really our declaration of freedom. It's our declaration of freedom from uh, the brokenness in our lives. It's the declaration of freedom from addictions. It's the declaration of freedom from, you know, living a life of shame and guilt. When we come to know Jesus and when we yield our life and surrender to him, something dynamic begins to transpire in our lives. And as we continue that journey and continue to grow in our understanding, more of this brokenness falls off in our lives and more hope and joy and peace becomes our portion. Do you know Jesus is alive right now? He's ruling and reigning and currently, I love this, he's praying. He's praying for you. He's praying for me. Isn't that a beautiful thought? You know, sometimes we might feel alone. Sometimes we are humanly we may be alone. But I want you to know that you are never alone because in the moment you give your life to Jesus, Jesus makes this incredible promise, I will never leave you nor will I forsake you. Isn't that, isn't that precious? How can he say that? Because he dwells within us. He lives within our lives. You know, most of the persecution that fell to the church came over the preaching on the resurrection. I don't know if you realize that. You know, this is what Paul said as he's standing before the Roman governor, Felix. He said, it is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. I don't know if you realize that many of the Jewish people didn't believe in the resurrection. They, didn't, they believed that once you died, that was the end of it. The, Sa the Sadducees certainly believed that. Now, there were Pharisees that believed that there was life after death, but you know, a lot of the Jewish people believed that was the end of it. That all you had was what this life had to offer. How many go that? That would be kind of a sad thing. For many people in the world, what this life has to offer isn't the greatest. There's a lot of sorrow, a lot of poverty, a lot of uh, difficulty in our human story. But we have a hope that transcends this world. This is only a small part of the life that you and I are going to enjoy. This is our earthly journey, but we have an eternal one coming, a, uh, a forever one. And it's going to be a lot different than this one. You know, Paul was preaching to those at Athens, and they were, they were actually struggling with this idea of the resurrection. Paul says it this way in Acts chapter 17. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this very subject. Paul says to us when he's writing to the Corinthians how critical this idea of trusting and believing and understanding this part of the story, that you and I need to be committed to this truth that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And this is uh, found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, probably the greatest chapter on the resurrection. He said, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. In other words, if that's not a reality, nobody's, nobody's alive after this life. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. In other words, he's talking to the believers there about those who had died before Christ returned. In other words, they were physically dead. He's basically saying that's a euphemism. Falling asleep speaks of a believer's death. He says, then they're lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But then he goes on, but Christ, I like that word, but. He goes, if that's true, then these things happen. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That is so powerful. So today we're going to travel back in time to that first message that God inspired Peter to preach the preaching of the resurrection, which is the key to understanding even the birth of the church. Do you know, without the resurrection, there would be no church. As a matter of fact, it is the only explanation for the church. 50 days after the death of Jesus, Peter's preaching 
and 3,000 people become followers of Christ. This is an amazing, you know, here's a church of 120. I've always thought about this. Could you imagine preaching one sermon and 3,000 people get saved and the next day your church grew from 120 to 3,120. How many go, that's a little overwhelming. Do you get an idea that when you're reading the New Testament, there's some overwhelming things that are occurring in these stories? Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, states four life-changing truths that when we embrace them, we're transformed from an ever-diminishing life because that's what's happening physically. The outer man is perishing. Every one of us is moving towards the end result, which is death. It says we move from an ever-diminishing life to an eternal one. And the moment we give our life to Jesus, the Bible says we now have eternal life. And eternal life is not just a forever life. Eternal life is a different kind of life. It's a quality of life that God brings because God now comes and dwells and lives within us. So let me take a look briefly at these four life-changing truths. Number one, the resurrection was planned by God. This is not, oh, uh, just kind of happened, right? You know, no, this was orchestrated. God had planned this before the foundation of the world. Jesus' incredible life, his awful death, this incredible miracle called the resurrection was planned from eternity. The whole thing, the birth, the death, was planned even in the very foundations of the world. God knew because God is omniscient. He knows everything. He knew that when he created us and gave us a heart like, in a sense, created us after his own image and gave us a will, the moment he did that, the opportunity for us to choose wrongly became in effect. And God, because he knew, we did. We chose poorly. And you know, before you blame Adam and Eve for all the mess they got us into, you know, which is easy to do. We always want to blame our ancestors for all the problems we're having today. Uh, just look at your own life. <laughs> I think a lot of us have made some pretty poor decisions. And I think we have to take ownership of that. Uh, given their, the choice, we would have done the same crazy thing. If it wasn't that situation, it would have been another situation. We would have failed. And God made a plan to rescue us and to show his amazing love toward us. And so let's pick it up in Acts chapter two, in verse 22. It says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. He's preaching this sermon now. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by, I want you to see this next phrase, God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. Isn't that beautiful? And you, with the help of wicked men, <laughs> you know, just because God said, I knew this was gonna happen, it doesn't get us off the hook. We still did it, right? With the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So Peter begins by pointing out the unique nature of Jesus Christ. Miracles, signs, wonders. I mentioned one, you know, calming the raging water, walking on the water, raising the dead himself. He raised others back to life, healing the sick. You talk about the many things Jesus did. Jesus is the anointed one. That's the word Messiah or Christ. It means anointed. It was to come and save his people from their sins. Peter's speaking to an audience that's well aware of all of these facts. There's no disputing the miraculous nature of Jesus' ministry. And I like what John Meyer, who wrote in the New York Times, he wrote an article and he says, you know, many treatments of Jesus gets bogged down in the discussion of the possibility of miracles. Properly speaking, that's a philosophical rather than a historical or an even a theological problem. He goes on to say, all that need be noted is that the ancient Christians, Jewish and pagan sources, all agreed that Jesus did extraordinary things not easily explained by human means. As a matter of fact, while Jesus' disciples pointed to the Spirit of God as the source of his power, Jewish and pagan adversaries spoke of demonic or magical forces. 
It had never occurred to any to claim that nothing happened. So now you remove us like 20 centuries later, and we act as if, you know, miracles are, you know, we, we just have a hard time believing that stuff. You know, people that, that was happening to in the first century, they didn't, they didn't dispute what was happening. The argument was, what's the source of it? You know, today we try to live in denial. We pretend these things cannot happen. But you know, some of us have experienced miracles in our lives and we know that God is a miracle working God. This is God's, uh, well what this tells us is that the early opponents of Christianity never doubted the fact that Jesus did incredible supernatural miracles and signs, even though people today may struggle with miracles happening now. Well, this is God's uh, deliberate plan. Notice the expression, handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. Even though they were personally responsible for committing this great injustice by handing over Jesus to the Romans to be crucified, Peter points out that God even incorporates man's sinful behavior to fulfill his ultimate purposes. How many of you go, this is amazing. You can take the worst things that have ever happened, turn them around and use them for good. And God does that. This is the greatest evil. You know, God himself, sinless, comes, the perfect person, and as human beings, we kill him. Isn't that amazing? And yet God uses that very act of evil as a means to bring about eternal salvation for humanity. I think that's, that's incredible. Who would have come up with that game plan, right? Only God thinks of these things. Uh, the Old Testament foretold through the scripture, that's what prophesying said, the Messiah's birth, his miracles, his betrayal by a close associate, the abandonment by the disciples, being given over to Gentiles, crucified and ultimately spoke of his resurrection. None of these things happened by accident. Over and over again we read in the Old Testament and it's pointed out by the apostles who wrote the New Testament, quoting the Old Testament, that God planned all of this. Jesus was a willing participant in the entire plan of salvation. This was not something that Jesus had no control over. It was an act that he willingly chose. He did so to express his love towards us. You know, I, I remember reading the story during World War I where a young French uh, soldier who was seriously wounded, his arm was so badly smashed that the surgeon had to amputate and take his arm off, and he felt really terrible about it, and so he waited till this young man you know, came out of, you know, his surgery and came back from his anesthetic, recovered consciousness. And when his eyes opened, the surgeon said to him, I'm so sorry to, have tol to tell you that you've lost your arm. Sir, the young man said, I did not lose it, I gave it. In the same way, Jesus was not helplessly caught up in a mesh of circumstances that he could not break free. He could have called legions of angels to rescue him. Apart from any divine power he might have called on. It is quite clear that to the end, he could have turned back and saved his life, but he chose not to save his life. He knew he had to lose it in order for us to save ours. It was a choice he willingly made. He accepted it for us. Let me move to the second uh, truth. Simply, it was promised by God. What God says, he'll do. Now, you and I can make all kinds of promises. And, you know, maybe have every intention of fulfilling that promise. But, you know, sometimes things beyond our control can keep us from fulfilling exactly what we said we're going to do. That's true. How many know if God doesn't have that problem? When he promises, he makes sure it happens. He has that ability. He can control things. We can't. And so... Uh, he can take our willful refusal to do his will and still work out his purposes. That's what I love about God. How many know God even uses a person like Pharaoh? And that's a classic example. You know, I don't know if you've ever read it in the book of Exodus. It says, and, you know, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And then you read, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. Sometimes people are a little confused when you read those two expressions because you go, wait a minute. Did God harden his heart or did Pharaoh harden his heart? And the answer is both. 
You see, God knew the nature of this man and God allowed the uh, judgments of, and plagues to come upon the nation and knew that his response would be to actually harden his heart and defy uh, what Moses was asking him to do and that was to release the people. Because you have to understand something. What we fail to understand is that Pharaoh thought he was God. You see, the, the Pharaohs thought they were deities. And, and so when Moses was telling them to let his people go, and he said, well, who's telling me to do this? They said, the, our God is. Pharaoh thought he was greater than Yahweh. How many know he didn't win that match? Uh, he kind of lost out. But I think we need to understand that. And then Peter explains that Jesus' resurrection was actually promised in the scriptures. And he's quoting from Psalm 16. Let's take a look. This is found in Acts chapter 2. This is just a direct quote. He said, David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of death, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can confidently tell you that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. So now Peter's explaining how David could say the psalm but it didn't apply to himself, it applied to one of his descendants. And we know from scripture that Jesus was a descendant of David. He goes on to say, seeing that uh, what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was, would not be abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor his body seek decay. Well, we know uh, not only was David's body decaying, it was still in his tomb, but Jesus' body was missing. It was a known fact. Rather, David, under the inspiration, share, is sharing the promise of the resurrection. He knows he's not writing about himself because Peter could point out David's tomb is in Jerusalem. In our trips to the Holy Land, one of the things we always do is go to David's tomb. It's in the city of Jerusalem. And, uh, oh, I thought I had a slide there of it, but that's okay, we'll move on. It's there. Oh, okay, that's David's tomb. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at a blank screen back here, and you're looking at David's tomb. <laughs> so what is, what is Peter saying is, well, we have David's tomb, but the tomb, the body that we don't have is Jesus. It's missing from the tomb. Uh, in Matthew's story, and I love, there's a little obscure text. I don't know if you've ever picked up on this, and, and I, I think this is so amazing. It's found here where um, Peter and the disciples basically, you know, if there was any doubts about that body being missing, Peter could just drag that crowd down to the tomb and say, hey, it's empty. And so the rumor was circulating that the disciples had stolen his body. But, you know, Peter could point these, these kinds of things out. Okay, so here's an empty tomb. This is one of our trips. That was a few years ago. <laughs> okay, here's that obscure text. So in Matthew 27, it says, And when Jesus, this is talking about his crucifixion, when he had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rock split. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of the temple's curtain, but it's like, you know, 10 feet high. And no kidding, it, it was torn right in half from the top. So all of the priests do something unusual that happened. Now, how many know the people standing around the crucifixion knew something was happening? Because uh, most, most scientists would say, well, there was an eclipse. It was a total darkening of the sky. They had an earthquake. The ground was shaking. There was natural manifestations happening at his death. But now between verse 51 and 52, two days go by. Sometimes you don't always pick this up, but listen to how it's worded. The tombs broke open 
and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city, which is Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. Now, I don't know about you, to have dead relatives showing up at your house (laughs) probably would get your attention. And so Peter's preaching to a whole bunch of people who had been there during the Passover, had seen the, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus, and now they're seeing a whole new thing begin to emerge, and some of the people living in town are seeing dead people show up who've been resurrected from the dead. Do you get a little idea that God is you know, amping up the evidence that uh, Jesus is alive? Anybody get a sense of that? So Peter's preaching away here, and you know, like I said, how many of us would be a little bit unnerved if you had a dead relative show up? Anybody get a little excited about that? That'd be a little unnerving. I, I, I don't know, I think it would be. Let me move on to the third life-changing truth, and it's simply this, it was accomplished through the power of God. This is a miracle of incredible magnitude. To be brought back to life could only be accomplished by God's power. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the Romans, this is, he's, he's giving us the compelling sign that Jesus is, the, you know, is actually the Messiah. He's actually God in the flesh. He says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised, the good news he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son as to his human nature was a descendant of David. But then he says this, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God, how? When, when do, when, what's the evidence that he's more than a man? The resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So Peter's now stating that it was impossible for death to hold Jesus. The power of his sinless life could not keep him in the tomb. So here's the text, Acts 2.24. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Now, it's interesting that this language is used. It's actually, uh, it's literally speaking of death and childbirth. How many go, those don't normally go together, right? But, Howard Marshall says, we have a remarkable mixed metaphor in which death is regarded as being in labor and unable to hold back its child, the Messiah. If we ask why death could not hold back Jesus, Peter's reply would be that Jesus was the Messiah and that the Messiah could not be held by death. It's very powerful. One of the most compelling arguments for a resurrection or a resurrected Christ and the demonstration of God's power is seen in the change in people's lives. Now you have to remember, these guys, they thought Jesus was the Messiah, they invested everything into him, then they see him crucified, their understanding of what the Messiah was gonna come and do was totally wrong, they were totally, you know, they were thrown, you know, their whole world seemed upside down. Now, all of a sudden, Jesus is alive, and Jesus is now explaining to them what the Old Testament was actually saying and what he came to accomplish. He didn't come to defeat an impressive Roman Empire. Jesus came to defeat humanity's greatest problem. You say, what is it? It's sin. And when you defeat sin, you defeat its consequences, which is death. And so Jesus came to defeat sin and death. That's why what he came to do was so much greater than anything they could imagine. This is the good news, that you and I can have forever life. That's powerful. Then you, you, know, you take a look at the transformation in these people's lives who give their lives with this message. Then you get a guy like Paul, Saul of Tarsus. How do you explain his life? This guy is a Pharisee. He's a radical. He's a, he is so upset with you know, the Christian church. He's out resting Christians. He's out persecuting them. He's out 
having them killed. Stephen is one of the examples we read in the book of Acts where you know the garments are laid at his feet as they're stoning t- uh, Stephen to death. And so what has happened is Paul all of a sudden moves from the number one opponent of Christianity to the number one proponent of Christianity. How do you move somebody from there to there? And the answer is he met Jesus. Now, most of us don't meet Jesus like Paul did. Now, that, that's a really radical move. You know, he's traveling along to Damascus, and boom, he sees the resurrected Jesus. And it changes his whole life. He's revolutionized. He's transformed in his life. And now he becomes the, the Apostle Paul. And, uh, I mean, the greatest argument for uh, I believe that the trans, you know, the resurrection is what happens to people when they meet the risen Jesus. It changes lives, and that's the last one. It's, you know, that's one of the reasons why I think the enemy battles so strongly in our lives. I think that slide slipped. It'll, it'll come back to that point, but it's the presence of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers. Not only is the resurrection a fact, but the release of the Spirit into our world. The indwelling presence of God is proof that Jesus is alive from the dead. You know, you and I, you know, something happens inside of us. We're changed, you know. I don't know, some of you grew up in a Christian home. It became, it's a very imperceptible change. It's kind of a slow transformation. You know what I'm saying? I get the story. I I continue to believe it. I'm slowly developing. For some people, though, it's quite radical. You know, some people, they didn't grow up in a Christian home. They hear the story. Their life is broken. Many of them are in rebellion. I mean, I don't know if you've ever done the Alpha series, but some of the people that they have testified there, their lives were like they were prisoners. And all of a sudden, you know, there's transformation that brings about incredible change in their lives. I know for myself, in my own life, when Christ became real to me, you know, it felt like the sky was bluer, the grass was greener. I, I, I just all of, I felt like I was awakening from the dead. It felt like I had been stuck in a huge mansion, I was locked in one room, and now all of a sudden I was out running around finding all these other things that were out there. It was like unbelievable. I'm going, really? I just didn't understand any of these things. It, it, it just, you know, and it just keeps going and going. And no matter how long you walk with Christ, it never gets old and it never gets boring. Yeah, I know the basic story, but there's so much more to it. There's so much more to explore. There's so much more to learn about God. Why is that? Because he's infinite. You never tire. You know, a lot of people take on a hobby and eventually they get bored with it. This is not boring, folks. It never becomes boring when you start walking with God because it gets more exciting as you walk with him. Now it says here, uh, so God raised Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of this fact. He exalted to the right hand of God. He's received from the Father. The promised Holy Spirit has poured out on what you now see and hear. The Holy Spirit brings about change through human lives. Therefore, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit is one of the most powerful proofs of Christ's resurrection. He's at work today convicting and convincing people of their need for Christ. And you know, years ago I read the story about a trans world radio uh, outreach to Cuba. And there was a young man named McGill. He'd grown up in a large family, received very little attention from his parents. Early in life, he was full of anger, hatred, fighting. At 14, he left home, traveled to Havana for school, went to the coast, became involved in the tr- drug traffic, planting, cultivating marijuana and cocaine. He had several hectares of coca plants with a team of about 40 workers. On one occasion, he was called on to examine a plot some distance away, and he had forgotten to take in any reading material. So the older lady that had kind of run the plantation gave him a New Testament. He began to read the New Testament. I'll tell you, there's power in God's word. He started reading about Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. He was so taken up with the story that he actually began a Bible reading group among his employees. Now, he's not even saved, okay? So now what are they doing? All these cocaine growers, 40 of them, are reading the Bible and discussing it. Did anybody find the humor in this? I just love God. God is amazing. 
So one day he suffers an accident. And being in pain that night, he turns on the radio to distract his thoughts, and he ends up listening to a gospel program from Trans World. And the speaker is talking about how terrible it is to have an empty life, full of guilt, full of shame, full of sin, and have no purpose in life. And he makes a decision at the end to give his life to Christ. And after he recovers from his accident, he cuts down his plant, burns his laboratory, gets rid of everything related to the drug trafficking world. His workers now come back from a vacation because he was sick, they had all left. He shares his experience with them and explains that what they were lacking and every last one of those 40 workers gave their lives to Jesus. Now, that's amazing. And then what happens is he says, from our little band of cocaine farmers have come 12 pastors. And this guy planted 10 churches and for the last six years we're pastoring a little town in the interior. And he said, oh, by the way, the lady who gave me the New Testament is a leader, one of the groups, and, and there's other pastors in other parts of the country. So the same Jesus, that, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is able to raise us up from our spiritual death, which is our separation from God. That's what death really is. He's able to change us into the people that God intends for us to become. So what should our response be? You know, God, God went through a lot of trouble. He promised it, he planned it, he provided it through Christ. Through the power of the Spirit, he raised Jesus from the dead. Through the power of the Spirit, listen to this, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. When you and I come to Christ, he resurrects us from our spiritual state of death. And now we become alive with God. That's a very powerful statement. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now lives in you if you're a child of God. The same spirit that resurrected Jesus from the dead lives in us. That's pretty powerful. So what are we to do? What was the response of the people on the day of Pentecost? Well, verse 36, uh, it says, therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, whom you crucified. I mean, you talk about pretty direct preaching. You know, you guys killed them. He's your Lord in Christ. Now, now, now these guys, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. In other words, they were convicted. They felt bad. They felt terrible. They felt sorrow. It's, and they said, what should we do? And Peter said, repent. Change your mind. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which you are now asking me about. The same Spirit's going to come and live inside of you. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were at, baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Powerful. They repented, which, which, which really means they came into agreement with God's understanding of their condition, and they turned to him. They were baptized as an outward expression of an inward change in their life. They received God's indwelling presence and became part of God's community of faith, the church. What was true for them is true for us today. Let's stand. I don't know, I always get excited. You know, I know it's Easter, I'm excited, but I'm excited every Sunday. You know, that's just my nature. Why is that? Because the Spirit of God is at work. And you know, maybe you're here and you're going, I, you know, I was invited to come, you know, it's Easter, I'm here, you know, just trying to be polite. But I believe that the Spirit of God does things in our life. You think, oh, well, I just kind of stumbled here. Or, you know, I, I, I thought I'd just come to church and that would be the end of it. But God has a plan. God has a plan. And you're here for a reason. And you're hearing this message. This is a life-changing message. It could move you from a state of despair, brokenness, state of confusion. You know, a lot of times you, you ask a person, you know, what is your life all about? What's your purpose? Well, I think God designed you for a purpose. And once we get to know the designer, then we get to know the purpose. I love that about God. We're all here for a reason. We all have a purpose. And you're not an accident. You say, well, yeah, I think I was. No, you were planned by God. 
and he has a plan for you. And so you and I this morning, you know, we can just come in agreement with God. We can say, you know what? I have lived my own life. And I think sometimes as Christians, sometimes we get into that pattern where we're doing our thing. And I want to just challenge you. Think about this. It's about doing his will. Aren't you glad Jesus came to do the Father's will? Because of that, you and I can have salvation. You and I can have eternal life. When you and I do God's will, the Christian life becomes dynamic. I'm gonna say that again. The moment I start doing the Father's will, the Christian life becomes dynamic. Nothing static about it. Nothing's happening randomly or by accident. God now is directing and is gonna use every one of our lives for his honor and for his glory. And so I'm gonna encourage you this morning, you know, to say, hey, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna surrender. I'm gonna call out to Jesus. He's alive, folks. The Bible says, if two or three would gather in my name, I will be with you. I will be in your midst. I will be here right now. God is here right now. And if we call out to him, he will hear our call. He will set us free from our addictions. He will set us free from our brokenness. He will set us free from, you know, our despair. Whatever the thing is in our life that's trapping us and embittering us, God wants to free us. You know, Jesus said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And you know, you can live in freedom, spiritual freedom. That's the greatest freedom going. There's no greater freedom. Nobody can take that away from you. God gives you a gift. With every head bowed right now, I'm just gonna say a prayer. You can join me. You can join me in that prayer and say, you know what? I want to confess to you right now, Father, that I have been living my own life. But today I realize that you are real, you're alive. The evidence around me is too great. The way the world is ordered, the way I see people's lives being changed, I see a power greater than what I have in my life. And I desire that. I desire to know the one who created me, the one who framed me, the one who put everything inside of me and has a purpose for my life. And I want to receive the life that you intended for me. I want to walk in, in this new life, the life you promised, this eternal life, this quality of life. And it begins, Lord, I know, it begins right now. If I surrender to you right now, a new life will begin within me. I will become born again. I will become a new creation. I will become a, a person that is experiencing the life of God living within me. I want that. And I ask you to forgive me. Give me a change in my thinking and in my heart that I can serve you with all my heart. And I thank you for hearing my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So listen to me carefully. If you've made that commitment, you're going to need help on the journey. I said this a few weeks ago. I got it from Nikki Gumbel. I love it. Christianity is personal, but it's not private. It's personal, but it's not private. It's designed to be done in community. And nobody's going to make it on your own. You isolate you're done for. We have an adversary. We have an enemy that's out to destroy us. And we need one another. And when you realize that, we get stronger together. We can grow. So if you've made a commitment, you've never done it before, there's a little contact card in the pew. Pull that out. Write out your name and say, I've made this commitment today. I want to grow spiritually. And I know I need help. Let us know and we'll contact you and we'll help you in this spiritual journey. We thank you for coming this morning. God bless you as you leave today. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm the middle school youth director here at Living Stones Church, and I want to thank you for joining us this morning. We encourage you to fill out the Connect card on our website. We would love to hear from you and get to know you. If you have any prayer requests or if there's anything that we can do for you, please let us know. If you decide to visit us in person, please say hello. I would love to meet you. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.